Welcome to this webinar. Um, my name is Naho Miramachi, and I'm a professor of environmental politics at the Department of Geography, King's College London. I'm also the director, the co-director of the King's Water Center, and I'm totally delighted to be able to host this second Tony Allen Memorial Lecture Series. Um, we'll have 90 minutes with you, um, and I realize that there are some people who may know Tony who have worked with him for a very very long um, time, but perhaps those who don't know him. So I just thought I would give a, an overview of some of the, the things that he's done. And I'm sure you can see this on my screen right now. Um, Professor Tony Allen was an emeritus professor here in the Department of Geography at King's, but also um, at SOAS where he served for very many years. Um, and many of you would know him from his work on water management and water policy, uh, particularly around the work on the concept of virtual water. Um, he's also a Middle East, North Africa regional expert. Um, he has extensive work starting out from Libya back in the late 60s, if I remember correctly, and also in the early 70s. Um, and his experience and expertise in the Middle East, North Africa region spread over five decades. Um, he's also very much uh, someone who has been a mentor, a friend, a great colleague, a great sounding board for so many people, both within university, academia, the research world, but also amongst professionals as well. And he founded a, a great network of interdisciplinary thinkers, scholars, and professionals around the world who are united in thinking about water, food, agriculture, and sustainability. Uh, so it's a great way uh, for the community, for this very uh, interdisciplinary, very broad community to come together on occasion like this. Uh, the intention of this Tony Allen Memorial Lecture Series is to really uh, take forward his legacy around these issues of water, food, uh, agriculture, thinking about environmental stewardship, water stewardship, um, and really hold a platform for thought-provoking, critical thinking uh, on these debates. Uh, we would like to bring, continue to bring together this interdisciplinarity across research, professional and practitioner communities. So I'm very delighted that today we have our second um, talk for this lecture series. Last year was our inaugural one um, given by Anders Jagerskog at the World Bank, uh, which was about water in the MENA region, victim and casualty rather than source of conflict, noting Tony Allen's extensive MENA region uh, links in the past. And this year we're thinking uh, specifically about Tony's work on water stewardship and farming, which was something that really ran throughout all of his career uh, throughout the many decades of his extensive research, but particularly in the latter stages of, of his career, he really thought about how do we engage with this food system, thinking about the way in which we can better think about water stewardship when water particularly is not well uh, accounted for in this complex food system. So he really brought together the thinking around the political, political economy of water and food um, into the picture. Um, I'm also delighted this year to make a special announcement, which is to say that at the Department of Geography, we will be hosting a Tony Allen Prize for the best uh, MA or MSc dissertation on water, food, agriculture, and broadly related topics on this. So um, we are very excited that we will also be able to continue nurturing the next uh, generation that Tony was also very fond of. He was a great educator. Um, so I'm very pleased that we can make this announcement and hopefully um, it will go towards uh, the next generation's thinking, critical thinking as we move forward. Um, this year, uh, as I say, we will have a talk by Lydia Smelkova on the topic advocating for a better food system and water stewardship. What are the roles of farmers and consumers? I'll just give a small uh, introduction on who Lydia is. Um, she has an extensive experience, 20 years of experience working for better and more sustainable food systems. She worked uh, for a decade as the program director for the Italy-based nonprofit Slow Food International. 
um, and she has led lots of projects on the ground on food and farming in Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia on behalf of the Foundation of Biodiversity, as well as designing global nutrition and food education programs. Um, she's also been the sustainable food advocacy leader in the US as the head of National Food Day campaign at the Center of Science and Public Interest in Washington, DC. Uh, and she worked on this for five years and she's currently working as a consultant for the World Health Organization's Department of Nutrition and Food Safety. Um, I believe Lydia has a very special connection to Tony, but also to the department. Um, she was a student here many years ago. So um, we're delighted to also welcome back a graduate um, to give us this talk on food systems and water stewardship, uh, considering the extensive experience and very exciting um, projects projects that she has led on. I believe she'll give us a little bit more uh, detail of these projects and give us some time for Q&A towards the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded, uh, so you'll be able to listen to it later again. Um, we'll share the details uh, through our website. Um, once we have our talk, uh, we'll open the floor to Q&A. Um, you're welcome to use the Q&A button that shows up um, on the top of your screen. Um, we'll also try and monitor the chat, but um, it would be great if you could put you, uh, your questions into the Q&A so that we know where and what to look for. Um, when things start to get um, exciting, I'm sure many people will be posting questions, so we just want to keep track of them. So please post them in Q&A. Uh, please don't hold off until the end of the talk. You can just put in these questions as we go along. And um, once the talk has finished, we will be able to unmute you. Um, and if you're able to, you can also turn your screens on to ask your specific questions. Um, so I think that's enough talking from me. I will stop sharing my screen. And I will give the floor to you, Lydia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nahal. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Greetings to everyone who joined us online. Um, it's a great honor and very humbling for me to take part in the second lecture of the Tony Allen Memorial Series. I graduated, as uh, Nahal mentioned, with uh, Professor Tony Allen in Environment and Development class in 2010. And he has been a truly exceptional and very inspiring supervisor. He pushed the limits and he encouraged to achieve more. While preparing for today's lecture, I was looking over a decade of correspondence with him, noting, for example, uh, his comments that the values that drive the commercial parts of the food supply chain enable profits to be made and taxes paid, but they do not protect human and environmental health and particularly that the global food system is uh, blind to the stewardship of water ecosystems. So what I would like to talk about today is how this can be changed and how advocacy for a better food system and water stewardship and the roles of farmers and consumers in this challenging effort. But before I start, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, about my background and how I started to work on what I'm doing now. I grew up in what was then Soviet Union. We had a plot uh, in the countryside where we grew our fruits and vegetables. And when I moved to Italy to start working for Slow Food International, my work was to support Eastern European communities, chefs, farmers, scientists, to protect the forgotten skills and traditional food products that were often taken for granted and not regarded because people were looking at the Western diet as a model. Years later, I accepted a position in Washington DC to work on the first national campaign to improve the American system, system food day. And I thought, well, if the American food system can improve just a little bit, it can really have a big impact on the rest of the world. And uh, so to start with, I'd like to give you some numbers to give a context of the food systems that we live in today. And um, we know that food should be healthy, affordable, and produced with care for the environment, for the planet, animals, and men and women who grow, harvest, and serve it. But unfortunately, very often, food system is not working, it's broken, and it puts this ideal out of reach. Too much of the food that we eat does more harm than good. 
to uh, us, to the environment and uh, to the farm animals, and also to the quality of life. And so the global food system is in urgent need of reform. Today, over 800 million people are hungry, but at the same time, about one third of food produced is lost or wasted. And you would um, think that in rich countries, like for example, the United States, there is no excuse for hunger, but over 50 million people, that's one in six, rely on food assistance to put food on the table. And um, at the same time, 2 billion people are overweight or obese, that makes one in four. And um, if we think about the biodiversity, 75 of edible plant varieties have been irreversibly lost. And in Europe, uh, half of animal breeds became extinct. So the production of food is a central point in um, this crisis. And uh, we hear daily about water shortages, climate change, excessive use of fertilizers, loss of biodiversity and threatened ecosystems. And uh, we also know that food requires an enormous amount of water to produce that over 90% of fresh water is used for the production of food. So every time we talk about, talk about food, agriculture, food systems, we imply water because it's a, those are the main consumptions of the fresh water in the world. So it is critical for the food consumers, food producers and policymakers to align for a more sustainable food system with improved water and environmental stewardship. And currently many grassroots movements and campaigns advocate for better and more sustainable food system, but what does it take to achieve this change? For example, Slow Food is an international movement that was born in Italy about 40 years ago. And Slow Food envisions a world in which all people can access and enjoy the food that is good for them, good for those who grow it, and good for the planet. Slow Food describes consumers as co-producers, putting the responsibility on the consumers for the food that is being produced as well, and for the better food system that Slow Food defines as good, clean, and fair. Good stands for the taste quality because food should be tasty. Clean is uh, environmental sustainability because food cannot be produced by ruining the ecosystems, abusing the water resources and environmental resources. Uh, and it must be produced with the respect for environment and biodiversity. And FAIR stands for fair treatment of the people working along the food production chain. So um, social justice, also fair recognition and fair payment for their work. To make this vision come true, Slow Food works directly with the small scale farming communities around the world, offering support, provides education programs for consumers, both taste and food education, and also convenes in-person gatherings, creating in this way a network, a network of consumers and farmers around the world. And one of the examples of these meetings is a Terra Madre, a world meeting of food communities that brings together people from all, over uh, 130 countries. And Slow Food has incorporated their virtual water and water in its advocacy in the past. Here you see an image from a Terra Madre meeting uh, that included an infographic on water that is needed for the production of uh, the most consumed food products. And this infographic was prepared by Angela Morelli, uh, who worked closely uh, with Tony Allen and who is an information designer who visualized the water footprint data. So education of consumers has always been critical for the work of slow food, because the idea is that the good, clean and fair food is only possible if those who eat and those who produce are part of the same solution. And slow food helps people to understand why they should care about the food they eat, where it comes from, how it's produced and by whom it is produced. And more recently, slow food got involved in the policy advocacy as well, promoting policymaking to ensure consistency between different policies, food, environmental health, trade, and agriculture. Through its foundation for biodiversity, slow food addresses biodiversity loss and offers a viable future for small scale farmers and also for local varieties of plants and species of animals. 
it has been one of the first groups to turn its attention to domestic biodiversity because diverse systems are much more robust and they are more resilient than monoculture ones. And diverse systems are also uh, better to overcome environmental or climate change shocks. Slow Food provides support to the artisan producers through direct interventions, for example, selecting products on a number of criteria, main being taste, place of origin and sustainability, and helping with uh, any sorts of support that the farmer might need from creating a protocol of production and association of producers, helping with marketing, with uh, designing a label and um, other, uh, other tasks. Sometimes it takes even more, for example, build a dairy for cheese that is being produced in homes and needs to be produced in a more uh, standardized facility, not, not to be lost. And um, one experience I would like to share is uh, when I traveled to Uzbekistan in 2007 with the major as expert of almond varieties in Italy, Francesco Sutile, Uzbekistan is considered to be the birthplace of almond groves uh, and the birthplace of wild almonds that still has hundreds of undiscovered varieties. Uh, it's positioned on the ancient Silk Road and Slow Food created a project there to give value and to support the ancient varieties of almonds and also the desserts produced with those. However, what the farmers told us is that during the Soviet Union uh, in the 90s, when there were shortages, most of the wild almond groves were chopped down for wood. And here you can see the picture of some trees left uh, on, on the top because farmers didn't have money to buy wood for cooking. Um, farmers also didn't know that the forest contained all that biodiversity and um, were not, not aware uh, that uh, th this loss might be irreversible. And um, at that time, the local Schroeder Institute research in the almond varieties has cataloged only 56 of them, uh, while supposedly hundreds more were in the, in the wild groves that were, were lost. So the, the takeaway from, from my slow food experience is that farmers in small farming communities were focused on having their basic needs met. They have to feed their families, uh, produce a product that is safe to eat, that doesn't make people sick. For cheese or jam, for example, they might uh, need help with marketing or, or producing of a label. And they don't think, or they sometimes they don't even know about water stewardship, about the role they play in, in the water in the world beyond the water needed to ir irrigate the plants. And until the basic needs are met, like the need for food, for warm shelter, for clothes, it can be really hard to encourage the water or environmental stewardship unless there is a clear financial incentives. So water stewardship needs to be reflected in the price that farmers are paid for the food they produce in a similar manner how the environmental stewardship is reflected in the price that people are willing to pay for the products promoted by slow food. For slow food projects, for example, food is part of the traditional heritage. It's um, a product that must be artisan, small scale, produced in the area of its historical production and consumed locally. And Slow Food's position paper on biodiversity discuss water pollution and water use and the use of the natural resources, including air and soil, but it addresses water from the angle of irrigation. Slow Food also includes water resources in its position paper on food loss and waste, mentioning the amount of blue water that is wasted with the food every year that is 250 square kilometers. Green water and virtual water, however, don't seem to be directly addressed by slow food. And uh, it is worth noting also that the solution of the international trade as a means to overcome food insecurity through the virtual water traded in food products doesn't necessarily go in line with the aspect of slow foods philosophy, which advocates for local consumption and local networks of producers and consumers. So, Another experience I would like to share is from a different part of the world, is the one of Food Day, a grassroots campaign that was launched in the United States 
with the vision from the Center for Science and the Public Interest based in Washington, DC in 2010, which received a grand swell of support from get-go. It was the first national campaign to improve the American food system. Food Day was created as Earth Day, but for food issues with thousands of events and initiatives across the country from entire school districts, hundreds of colleges, resolutions signed by governors and a lot of media coverage. Food Day uh, held uh, several marquee events, one of them being an eating in Times Square, trying to attract attention and raise public awareness about the broken food system. The screens projected Food Day logos and the mayor of New York gave out apples at a subway station. And Americans from all 50 states celebrated Food Day. After several years, it grew to 8,000 events, building a movement to change the American food system. But why would America need a day like this? The United States have a reputation for its bad diet and for getting people sick. Its food system contributes to obesity, health problems, environmental degradation, low wages for food and farm workers, and also promotes cruel conditions for farm animals. And health, hunger, environment, animal welfare, and farm worker justice are all part of the same system that is in need of reform. And so too often, all these issues are seen as separate ones with groups just focusing narrowly on their own work and um, not working together as a whole. But to make progress, there is a need to have a unified effort, a mixing of uh, missions and actions and exchange of energy and ideas between the groups. So how can, how can people and organizations bring all these pieces together and start thinking as one connected single issue about the food system and not about separate different things? So Food Day was created to try and address this question because reforming American system was such a huge task, the groups felt need to get out of their silos and collaborate one with another for faster progress. So how was it organized? Why people who are busy with their everyday tasks and everyday missions would spend time of doing something and actively organize events? So we knew that everyone likes to know that even their modest local activity is part of something bigger something national that can have a real impact. And we also know that many students, government officials, nonprofit groups and companies care about the harm uh, and reduce it harm that the American food system is doing to people's health and environment. So we created an advisory board with the leading figures of the food movement and then spread the word more broadly. And almost everyone we contacted said that they want to be involved in some way. So we reached out to thousands of people and groups at the local level, tried to make sure there is cross-sector presence at meetings, shared stories they learned and shared a lot of tools and resources and fact sheets. We also include the information uh, about the water used for food production as illustration that it takes about 15,000 liters of water to produce uh, one kilo of beef. And so while America has some unique problems, the challenges of nutrition, health and sustainable agriculture and water stewardship are global. And these principles can help create positive change and exchange of ideas and energy between the groups can be part of the solution of tackling future food issues. And the takeaway that I would like to share from the food day experience that it was just incredible to see how much can be reached in only one year of campaign organizing. The country came together to advocate for better food. The moment was right. There was a lot of interest and support. There was nothing like else. A unifying action across the sectors and across different states with a common goal of making the food better. And um, within several years, mayors of major cities signed proclamations. All major university campuses, around 300 of them, engaged students and organized events. And uh, Entire school districts, for example, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, celebrated food day in the cafeteria serving a better meal for over half a million students. So there is an increase in awareness in the United States of the link between water, land, climate, agriculture, and food, but much more needs to be done. Efforts are being made by, for example, a nonprofit food tank, which was a partner of the food day campaign, Food day, food day 
a campaign and food tank regularly talks about the global water footprint, uh, about the water hiding food and about the invisible consumption of virtual water. They provide easy to understand striking facts. For example, if eaters switched to a vegetarian diet for a day, it would save 1000 liters of water or that food consumption contributes to 89% of the daily water footprint. And uh, another takeaway is that the agenda and the issues of a campaign really depend on who leads it and funds it. Uh, but the Food Day experience shows that raising awareness and inspiring critical thinking can happen very fast if the moment is right and if the major stakeholder groups and major actors are involved. Another takeaway from the campaign is that for something to flourish and go on, it needs a sustainable source of multi-year funding. And so these two examples bring us to the next step, how actually the change happens, how advocates achieve it. One campaign framework points to three distinct stages of a campaign. The first one is raising awareness. The second, is inspiring critical thinking. And then the third one is actually taking action that comes afterwards. And here of vital importance is the definition of target audiences, for example, because talking to everybody equals talking to nobody. Who exactly needs to hear the message for the change to happen? Whom we are trying to reach with the communication? Is it policymakers in water scarce areas or in the water areas that are abundant in green water? or large scale or small scale farmers, or maybe consumer groups that are already active in food and agriculture and sustainability issues. And also what are good communication moments? For example, World Water Day held annually on the 22nd of March provides an excellent opportunity with an attention to the importance of fresh water and the use of resources. And there are many examples of successful campaigns that promote behavior change. For example, the health impacts of smoking is widely acknowledged with even Hollywood cutting down on showing smoking on screen. And there is also increasing awareness of the wastefulness of running tap water while washing hands. For example, taps automatically shut off in public bathrooms and there is greater consideration at home as well. But there is not yet widespread public awareness of virtual water. Eating a water intensive food is not seen as bad as leaving the water tap on. And consumers play an important role in this. So I would like to look quickly at the considerations behind consumer behavior that actually influences food consumption. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into the detail, but let's quickly look at some of the factors that influence the choice of food. They can be split into two big categories, internal and external, so personal and environmental. And personal are the health considerations or taste and environmental is whether the food is available, the price, or maybe social peer pressure. But we can also look at two large forces that influence food choice, uh, one being taste or sensory preference to go in line with slow food thinking that food should be good to eat, it should be tasty. And the second is a big group of constraints that prevent a person from making a food choice according to what is preferred. Because of course we do not eat what we want always and as much as we want, because for me it would be cheese and chocolate and I wouldn't eat anything else. But um, here is an illustration of the negotiated food choice model to, um, to let us think about food choices and food preferences. So uh, sensory preferences include taste and smell and appearance. And the most frequent constraints are health considerations, price, whether the food is available, whether I have time to cook it, and also how much I know about the food and how it is produced and by home. And this model can be used to plot either persons or groups, food preferences and food choices. And it also illustrates the complexity of factors that influence the choice of food, because we constantly negotiate among sensory or taste preferences and other factors that influence the food choice process. So in section one, it's our first choice. It's the foods that are easily accessible, that are tasty, healthy and inexpensive. The section two is second best option. 
It's lower degree of taste preference, but few constraints as well. So it may be something quick, something less expensive, something easy or available. The section three is the guilt zone. Because for example, we ate something unhealthy or it cost too much. And the food in section four, they're consumed under the condition of restricted choice. So this model can also be used to plot the trajectories of desired changes or food preferences or food choices over time as a result of, for example, food or taste education interventions or awareness raising campaigns. For example, if we share information and promote critical thinking about what intense foods with the aim to shift consumer behavior, the foods that might be in section one, they can move to section three. So all the preferred foods, the information we have is put in a constraint on the choice. And so food doesn't stay in the food choice anymore. It, it remains a food preference. And here I'd like to also pose some open questions. Is the provision of information enough? And whether there are any types of consumer education programs or other interventions that may be needed to make this shift. And so moving forward, uh, how can Slow Food, Food Day and other initiatives do something to improve the food system? One of the answers is network is get and getting out of our silos. Imagine, for example, if in Italy, Slow Food included virtual water into its work on good, clean and fair food systems or the common agricultural policy in European Union subsidized the wider, wiser use of uh, water resources embedded in the food products and gave tax breaks to the producers. Or if the public procurement or public schools included incentives for serv serving the foods that are less water intense to produce. So this cross-pollination can be applied in different settings with groups taking a broader view and um, collaborating with each other. And uh, to conclude, I would like to share some reflections about the gaps and challenges and also areas where might, more work might be needed based on, on the previous reflections. So there are challenges around the links between water and food and food systems. And the first one is how consumers can become responsible water managers and actually exercise their power because Managers are usually aware of their actions and do consumers really know how much power they have in their purchasing decisions? Um, consumers might need a better understanding of the link between virtual water and food and the impacts that their everyday choices have. Maybe greater education, raising awareness and knowledge translation is needed. And with so many variables influencing the choice of food and the consumers every day, sometimes with conflicting messages, for example, whether to eat healthy food or local food, uh, more education about virtual water is needed to allow for a really informed choice, for informed choices. And the second challenge is um, the role of farmers as water managers, because farmers need to recognize that they do have a very important role, and they also need incentives to counter the pragmatic considerations of the bottom line of what products are historically or traditionally produced and other considerations that have taken priority over water stewardships. Among the lessons learned at the grassroots level is that groups do need to get out of their silos and support each other's missions and work because with creating a net network, everyone can achieve greater and faster progress. It is important to work directly with producers and consumers to, to know and to have bo both points of view and provide information and assistance when needed. And policy advocacy is also very important to include. Just as Slow Food, after 30 years of working with consumers and farmers, got involved into political advocacy as well. Because the agriculture, the food production, consumers and policy sectors all need to align for better food systems and for the better water stewardship. Farmers need to have support to produce. Consumers need to be willing to buy and uh, know why. And policymakers need to produce the right laws to support the above. And as I mentioned earlier, advocacy efforts need a sustainable source of funding. And uh, reflecting on the areas of work uh, that uh, might be needed is, uh, one is how to include water accountability in existing efforts on food systems and environmental sustainability. Another one is uh, how to include advocacy efforts 
into policy making, how to include the concept of virtual water more into policy making, and of course, education interventions for consumers and the support to farmers to make water stewardship financially viable. And uh, I would like to conclude with uh, what Professor Tony Allen shared once with us during one of the lectures is that knowledge on a subject is not still, it, it wobbles. And every effort, every publication and discussion moves this knowledge just a little bit into a direction. And so for a change to happen for the food consumers, producers and policymakers to align for a better food system and water stewardship, many little pushes need to happen to move this knowledge into the desired direction. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that, Lydia. That was super informative, very rich in detail. And I, I really thought it was, um, it really touched upon so many issues that uh, Tony constantly reminded us about, about the role of consumers, about the way in which farmers are, are treated in this global food system, uh, thinking about the way in which we communicate. And Tony was a great communicator and he, he talked about how we need to engage um, with with different kinds of people, including policymakers. So this this was a, a very informative, but also a very much a flashback for me of many of the conversations that I had. Um, and, and I've also made so many notes that that I also want to start the questions. But um, I see some questions already rolling into the Q and A. Um, so maybe we'll start um, picking that up if that's all right with you. Um, on the screen we have Tamara, who's also one of our research assistants from the King's Water Center, who will help with the technical side of things. So um, if you if you are posting questions, please post them on Q and A. If you have any issues trying to post them, just please chat. Uh, to Tamara directly, um, and she will probably be able to solve this. So um, Lydia, the first question that I have from uh, uh, anonymous uh, attendee is that, um, as Lydia mentions, the amount of water required to produce food is often underappreciated by consumers. One intervention could be for governments to require suppliers or supermarkets to put this information on packaging. Is this under consideration anywhere? And is there any evidence that this would be a useful tool for communication shaping consumer behavior? Well, that's a great question and a great suggestion as well. Uh, a lot of considerations in general are, are done in the world by different countries by food labeling, by different information about nutrition or safety aspects that are provided uh, on a food label. So it's definitely the, the best tool to provide uh, the information to the consumer about, about the product directly. And um, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, provision information is the first step, but then what comes next? It, it's up to the consumer to, to take the decision and, and the choice, but I think it's an easy way to, to make the, the first step. Also, um, another aspect is what is mandatory and what is uh, voluntary. So whether uh, it can be suggested as a voluntary uh, part for the companies to include on the label as an additional, for example, information. But if I'm a producer of a water intense product, I might not want to advertise it as well. So probably it needs to be mandatory. I can envision pushback from the industry already. So uh, I think it's a great consideration and it will be definitely valuable for the, for the consumer part, for the consumers to receive information in, in that way. But um, yeah, as, as we know, it's three aspects. It's the food producers, uh, it's the, the consumers, and it's the policymakers. So um, in my opinion, uh, many elements in the food uh, production industry might not be very, very happy with suggestions like that, uh, but I think it would be an amazing tool. Mm. Yeah, I, I've been working with artists for the last 10, 10 years or so, um, curating different pop-up cafes of restaurants um, and, and cafes and turning their usual food menu into a virtual water menu. And this means that all of a sudden consumers have this menu in front of them that says their coffee is this many liters of water or their baked beans on toast is this many liters of water, their pizza margarita is this many liters of water. And what we've experienced over the 
many years doing this in different um, cities, actually. We've done this in London, we've done it in Milan, we've done it in India, et cetera, um, is that it's informative, but also the numbers can be off-putting and it doesn't really convey the actual message. So people would think that, oh, if this dish is over a thousand liters, then it must be bad. And that kind of normative bad isn't um, helpful enough for people to make decisions. So, you know, you, you, you could still have um, foods that are unhealthy for you, foods that um, are not necessarily um, sustainable, uh, even if that that number is um, is is a bit lower than something else, for example, or at the same time, even if you think um, this dish has a very high virtual water footprint, maybe it is because the 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 vegetable is naturally water intensive, and I think those nuances have been very difficult to communicate to a consumer who, um, in a cafe or a restaurant, you, 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 you're, 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 you're wanting to eat, right? Uh, you're not necessarily wanting to sort of be um, lectured on, or you're not necessarily needing all that sort of information. And so from, from a sort of communication perspective, my experience has also been um, more, more information doesn't necessarily mean changed behavior. Um, so yeah, but great question. Thank you for that um, to the person who posted it. We have another question from Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, I think you are still online. So if you want to, you are able to we can unmute you um, and you can ask your question live. Um, so tomorrow, would you be able to unmute, Lindsay? Hi. Hello there, Lindsay. Hi, I think, I yeah. Um, thank you so much for all this. It's really, really interesting. Um, part of the lectures that I actually did with you, Naho, um, I remember you saying, follow the money. Um, was was part of it and you know look I remember one of our first lectures was look at your salad bag or your salad in your lunch and think it through um, and I have a small shop so I'm, I've done I've completed my um, geopolitics resources and territory at KCL and at the same time I've been running my own little refill shop um, which focuses on packaging free goods and part of what I do, part of the purpose of the shop is advocacy, uh, greatly related to water. We're part of the circular economy and uh, I speak a lot to customers and local environmental groups, particularly around water footprint, uh, virtual water. When people buy rice, particularly, I explain why we have organic rice, particularly basmati and, and so on. Now, how in your graph you showed us um, like the the upper quarter part one, how and talked about shifting consumer thinking from part one to part three on more water intensive crops, for example, or water intensive foods. Um, do you think with the way that our food systems are at the moment, we will be able to do that in, in time, so to speak? Can we change people's views, educate people, advocate quickly enough to, uh, the, the, as we need to? Are you optimistic generally on that front or... Do you think that we're really against the clock? That's a good question. Thank you, Lindsay, so much for asking, because I think many people and many advocacy groups around the world are probably asking the same, uh, whether they're in time to accomplish their missions and to do what needs to be done. And I think that what happened, what I noticed in the last 10 or even 15 years is really spread awareness that something needs to be done. If when 20 years ago I started to work with slow food, it was very unusual to speak about food as part of cultural heritage or food as part of a bigger picture. I had to explain every time what, what was meant by that. And I'm talking about early 2000s. I think there is a clear understanding globally that something needs to be done that the way the food systems are today is not working. And I think there are many different suggestions, for example, 
Slow food offers one of the possibilities, focus on local production and in particular on agroecology, uh, uh, agroecological uh, approach to, um, to produce food to feed the world because we know that we can feed the world uh, through small scale family farms. They are one in nine today in the world. So they produce 30% of food, but uh, one, one, no, sorry, nine out of 10. Nine out of 10 farms in the world are small family farms. So um, the question is how bad it needs to become before the change happens. Uh, what I saw with the experience of the campaign in the United States is that a country can come together when there is a driving force and when there is a mission that's for the greater good. But I'm optimist and uh, I'm a, a campaign advocate as my background. So that's what I try to do to inspire people and to share the message. So I'm optimistic, but sometimes I do think is like how bad it needs to become for the actions to be taken because as uh, it was correctly mentioned before, people receive different messages and it's just a lot of information to consider. It's like nutrition experts say eat frozen. It's as good for you as fresh. Local uh, farming advocates would say buy from local farmer from the market, do not eat frozen. It's not as good, it's not as tasty. Um, you know, there are a lot of considerations to, to be taken. And I think it's really important to provide information for the informed choices to be to be done and for the system not to be broken, for the considerations not to be taken only based on short-term economical gain that doesn't take into consideration all other aspects that happens in many cases in, in the food production system. I don't know if it answers your, your question directly uh, because it's a very complex one, uh, but I believe yes, something can be done, but much more is needed to be done for that to be done. More groups need to come together, more networking needs to be done, more collaboration, more considerations, and also more urgent call to action because I don't think there is like an urgency feel yet uh, in, in the food crisis in the world. Thank you so much. Great, thanks for that. Um, it, it's it's great to also know that you're you're optimistic. Um, I, I I remember um, Tony being actually quite very optimistic about slow food. He was very inspired by slow food. I remember, and and I, I think it was exactly around the time that he he started supervising you. He he really got into this notion of slow food, and and I remember so many conversations that he was having. He was so energized by this campaign and thinking about the ways in which these kind of social movements could also um, shed better light on water and stewardship. Um, so I, I think in that way, he was he was also very, very positive as well and, and optimistic um, in, in that sense. Um, we have another question from OJ and I believe you're already unmuted. So please go ahead and if you would like answer, ask the question. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, um, congratulations again um, for the second uh, memorial for Tony. I'm very much touched to um, be on the receiving side of, of the lecture and uh, remembering him. Um, my question was partially answered already, but I'll go ahead and pose it because I'd like to, to, to sort of ask uh, the, the answer to come in a, in a different way. Um, first of all, I agree with the statement that the messaging the water element to the consumer is very important. And you know, with so many messages regarding various footprints, organic versus commercial, zero kilometer, fair trade and the like, uh, along with cherry-picked ESG or SDG indicators, it, it can be very confusing on the part of the co consumer. And um, it's, it's very confusing on my students also because this is uh, a midterm question to them every semester. Um, so um, obviously, you know, a... Um, it, awareness is important on the part of the consumer, but again, there is so much information. If we were able to 
sort of regulate this, put put a sort of a standard, a label, you know, some some sort of a you know common um, explanatory note on the products. What what should it be? Thanks so much for your question. So, do I understand correctly that? Your question it regards like all the array of information that your consumer receives, not only about the virtual water, but all, all others that exist. Correct. Out there. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have a, an easy answer because I think it's indeed very, very wide what type of information consumers receive for, for the food products. But I think in addition to like a label being put on the product or information provided at the point of sale. I think the main consideration is that in many cases, there is no like connection or even interest where the food comes from, right? Because if the consumer knows about different aspects of food production and is attentive to the labels, sometimes I can eat organic, sometimes not because it's too expensive. Sometimes I go for local. So that's one area of awareness, but I think very often, for example, my experience in the United States, the children would say it's a pear when you show them a potato because they've never seen a potato that is comes out of the ground with brown skin. Uh, so there are some areas where there is no connection with the food that uh, is consumed, that there is a big disconnect, that there is no knowledge of who produces, how, in which methods, like how the people live, why one product and not another. So I think in general, broader food education is needed about different aspects of food consumption. And uh, we are not including nutrition, like we're not talking about junk food and how bad it's for the diets and uh, for, uh, for, for the health of the people. But I think that the first step is why don't we include food education in the school programs? So young children have access to different sorts of information about food. They learn about virtual water and water stewardship. They know the difference about organic. They know that farmers need to be paid and not only you know, struggle to meet their ends uh, makes it, uh, uh, by selling their products. And uh, I would see this as a first step, as a broader education programs as a part, you know, like we are educated about road safety and uh, other other aspects of life but not not in some cases yes but not that much about food and food systems so i think that's like number one step and then the the second one is it's really uh i think as it was mentioned before there is no this critical understanding how much food systems influence what's going on in the world like from climate change to uh, all, all other aspects of, of, of the uh, ecological or environmental crisis. So I think a lot of effort is being done uh, on, diff on different levels by, by organizations, but much more is needed. So I, I won't see like putting all the information on one label as a solution because sometimes too much information is also confusing because it's just too, 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 too much is, uh, is, not, is not the best way to go. I would look more at, can we 20, 30 years down from now, what's the vision? We want people to be aware of their consumption. So we need to start with children. We need to start with young children. We need to start with school programs. We need to include the information sharing. So it needs to be, become kind of more like part of, um, of a life uh, of a person. So in 20 or 30 years, 30 years from now, a generation from now, we can have aware consumers who know actually and who make informed food choices because of course we cannot push a person to choose one product after another but if we provide information we can trust that the choice at least will be informed by by the available knowledge on the subject great thank thank you yeah may, maybe i could jump in on this point and, and and ask a question that i've been thinking about i i think there's a great role for education getting you know young consumers aware early rather than later um but here in the UK where we're based, there is a major debate around the cost of living, the cost of living crisis, and people are having to choose, are you going to heat your home or are you going to get your food? Um, 
they're thinking about, are you going to um, use most of your income for rent and then go to a food bank? And we've seen a huge increase in the people using food banks. So I, I wonder how organizations like Slow Food or the US campaigns are able to take into consideration these acute um, challenges of trade-offs and um, thinking about how, how poverty comes in very many dimensions. And if there is actually um, scope for people to make better decisions, even if they have the right information, the right knowledge, the right education in this, and what kind of debates um, at that point, um, when you were working with Slow Food or with the US campaigns, what kind of conversations were going on? Right, I think that's a great question because of course we cannot generically speak about the ideal world uh, with, the, with the issues like, as hunger and, and food access. Something that I, I came across when working in the United States is uh, also that sometimes eating healthy food that, that is good, good for you is not the question of expense, it's the, the question of uh, cooking skills. It's a, uh, the question of actually being able to, to prepare the food instead of buying re ready-made or is, instead of buying something something else that would be more expensive. I met a young, girl, young woman, uh, her name um, is Leanne Brown, who actually, as her student project, she wrote a book called Good and Cheap, a recipe book for the uh, people in the United States who rely on food stamps, that's the name of the food assistance, for their food budget. And it's about $4 a, a day. And so all her recipes are uh, using pulses, beans, grains, eggs, uh, seasonal fruits and vegetables, some um, chicken. Uh, and they, they require cooking, but they all tasty. They use spices. They are, they're, they're great recipes that can be cooked on a, on a budget. So that's, that's of course, one, one consideration to, to make that it's um, sometimes there is a need to invest more time for uh, for the food preparation versus this is the expense uh, of, of just buying something that requires less less time to prepare or a few skills. Something that Slow Food mentioned is the cost of healthcare versus the cost of food, because over the year, the years many countries saw the cost of healthcare go up and. Uh, amount of the family budget spent of, on food go down. Um, but food is the so source and the reason of many health problems are from obesity to heart disease to diabetes. So um, it's also a consideration, like I'm talking about the healthy part, about the nutrition of it. If I eat healthy, avoid junk food, spend maybe a little bit more on food and then down the line, Maybe my health expenses will be lower. So that's another another consideration. Mm -hmm. We also something that Slow Food President uh, used to mention is uh, the piece of clothes doesn't become part of me, but the food I eat it does become part of me. So it's also like the choice if I buy a branded piece of clothes or something uh, to show the status that I can afford, or whether I I spend more on something that actually becomes part part of uh, me because I, I I eat it. So it's also the the question of uh, um, you know different different ways to to approach it. Great, thanks for that. I, I think you, you mentioned at the start of your talk about social justice, and I think these questions really cut across these um, intersections of where we see social justice, whether it's you know access to cooking and energy, for example, or access to food, access to healthcare, access to education. So this is this is a really fascinating topic. I see a couple more questions in the Q and A. Um, we have uh, we had a post, a, a hyperlink from Muhammad. Um, I believe it was a link to a report. Um, would you like to post a question or, or would you like for us to share this hyperlink so that others can see? Uh, uh, thank you. It's the latter, really. It's for your information. Uh, okay, great. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for keeping us posted. Uh, I attended last year's lecture and I was so impressed. And I sent you this uh, information before. 
but uh, this one is uh, online and but it's distorted and it's got a lot of diagrams and uh, photographs and, and so photos and so on. So if you want, I can send it by uh, email uh, as well. And uh, is, the question is, is it possible to get access to the text of this uh, lecture? I normally write a review by translating it into Arabic and or Kurdish. Uh, so I will be uh, interested if, if I can get access to that uh, presentation today uh, in text. And Great. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Mohammed um, has sent in a hyperlink to a report uh, that is titled Mesopotamia Found Formulation of the Sustainability of its Natural Resources. And this yeah. continues with the MENA links that I mentioned with Tony Allen. So tomorrow we'll post this hyperlink, um, which is av available in multiple languages from what I can see on the link. Yeah. On the, on, in English, yeah. Yes. Uh, on the chat so everybody can see. Um, regarding the question of whether you can receive a text, um, we are recording this and we have a, a sort of closed captioning function that goes on. So we will also be able to share the text and not just the audio um, with you in due course when this, once this is completed and we put it up on the website. So please look out for an information on that. Um, Perfect. Okay, we'll move on to another question from uh, Naliswa. I believe you are, I, I think you could still be online. Yes, if you, if you would like to speak and ask your question directly, um, you're welcome to. If not, I'd be happy to read out your question. Okay, perhaps um, we are not able to get the question uh, in audio, but I can read out the question, uh, which is from Neliswa. Um, what approach, implement implementation strategy, and incentives do you think uh, would be most effective in engaging and encouraging smallholder farmers who uh, primarily prioritize meeting basic needs and ensuring food security? Uh, to not only reflect virtual water on food products, but also engage in water stewardship practices throughout the production process. Um, so what would be best for the smallholder farm farmers who need to do multiple things, meeting basic needs, ensuring food security, but then, as we've said, to think about virtual water and water stewardship. Um, Lilia, do you have a first reaction to this? Well, it's another great question because if we talk about small, small scale family farmers from um, traditional backgrounds, from farming communities who have been uh, farming for, for, for centuries, maybe similar or, or same products, reusing the varieties, seeing their seeds, that's the experience I have with their communities in Eastern and Central Europe and Central Asia as well. Um, I think a lot of farmers would be very happy and great to receive assistance, knowledge, sharing, to, to have access to, uh, to, to more information and uh, also to, you know, any, any tools. So, something to consider is that often it comes at a cost. Uh, the projects we did with the Foundation of, uh, for Biodiversity, they do require costs. They require, um, you know, the time to, to meet, for example, to discuss the protocol of production, an expert to travel, to share the information. Um, for example, what I saw in my ex personal experience is that very often there are no association of producers. For example, in Europe, uh, we come across very often association of comte cheese producers or of, of this product or that product. I haven't seen it that much. It's more like a village that produces something historically, but people do not come together. They do not discuss how they produce it. They do not discuss the recipe. They do not discuss how exactly they do it, how they do the, the method. There might be small differences in how they produce or package. So um, like for the front facing sales, it's, uh, it's not a good thing because the product needs to be consistent. If the consumer wants to buy a jam or cheese, it needs to have a similar taste. It cannot be different all the time. And, um, and so I think uh, all, all their uh, like support and interventions that we've done was 
like first bring the the farmers together. And in some cases, they've never done that before. They've never like sat around the table to discuss how they produce, what they produce, why they produce. Second is be respectful of their time because they all have their busy lives and families to feed. So you cannot just, uh, it cannot become the, you know, a, a drain of time and, and resources. So we never compensated them directly for like for, for coming and working, but they always received support that they needed uh, design of a label, help to write the protocol of production, an expert who comes and actually helps to produce it in, in a safer way or to meet the standards required for, for, for sale. So there should be a value for the farmer to engage in, uh, in an intervention uh, to, to actually like, dedicate time and, 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 and resources to sit at the table. But I think in terms of like summarizing is like the first step is People, people do uh, appreciate coming together and discussing what they do. Uh, they need to see a value, uh, like some, something that uh, adds additional uh, value to the product or to the way they, they produce and farm. And, um, and, and the third one is uh, the communities I have experience with. Uh, the, com the farmers were not exposed a lot to to the external support, but it was also based on very specific criteria of um, traditional varieties of uh, genetic breeds of animals and also varieties of local plants. Um, so they they were preserving this biodiversity and that's like why the foundation would come and work with them. Um, so I think that there are, there are many different considerations of, 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 that, of that type, but um, I always found very welcoming communities, all happy to work together, but we also always had to be very respectful and very uh, knowledgeable about you know, the, the, the time and the resources that we are asking to dedicate, to know that there is some value in return. I hope, yes, I, I hope um, this, this answered your question. Um, if you have further uh, follow-up comments, please post them on Q&A, we can pick them up. Um, but yeah, at, at this moment, maybe I should ask the question. Um, Tony quite often had these pithy statements, um, very short and punchy statements uh, that, that he used to like to repeat. And one of them was farmers will save the world. Um, when he really got into this latter phase of his career, thinking about environmental stewardship, water stewardship, accounting for water better in our globalized food system. Um, he, he realized that farmers are really very much at, at the center of this debate. And so one of his statements was farmers will save the world. So Lydia, I wonder, do you, do you agree with this? Having, having seen um, these various campaigns, working with the local farmers who, as you say, are, are busy and, and they're, you know, they're, they're not just going to do this for charity. They, they have to have a very strong justification of why they want to be engaged. So um, what, what do you think about this statement? Well, I think if you think after air and water, food is our third basic need. So everybody eats, it's really important. And the people who produce our food, they are extremely important. If I, the way I mentioned before, nine out of 10 farmers in the world are small family farms. So uh, that means that the traditional farmers in any country, they possess this wealth of knowledge often unrecorded about their product, about their, their way of production. It's passed down through the generations and they're very proud of what, what they do and what they, what they know. And uh, if you think about large scale farms, they probably follow more the market demand and the tax breaks and what is more viable, financially viable produced in this moment. And uh, family farms, I, I strongly believe they will play a very important role in addressing the food systems crisis in the world. Because um, sadly, however, they are also those who often struggle uh, with uh, having the basic needs met and uh, with uh, having the income for their families. So I think that protecting family farms and offering support they need will actually put them in the conditions for the statement to, to be true that 
farmers will save the world, but I would add family farmers will save the world. That's such an interesting point. I think there's there's a lot to be said around scale because you have very highly industrialized farmers who who you know who do this on a very large scale through highly tech technical means um, using various kind of um, technologies and automated systems. And then on the very other spectrum, you get family farms who who um, might might still also have that scale, but might also not be in, in such large scale, might be doing more traditional farming methods or using mixed kind of technology plus um, traditional methods of farming. So I think there's there's quite a lot of variance. I, I think there's a lot to be unpacked in this very sensational statement of farmers will save the world. And, and, and I like how you've sort of qualified that um, this time. Great. We still do have a few more minutes. We have about 10 minutes or so um, to take any final comments, questions. Um, if people would prefer to just raise their hand and not, not type, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you have any final comments, thoughts, questions, reflections, this is your moment. Yes, I think we have one comment from Francesca. Uh, Francesca, do you want to unmute yourself and tell us about the situation in Italy? Um, and yes, hello. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Hi there. In the video, hi. Uh, I have a question which is very practical and um, that I will have to, to deal with in the next years. In Italy, we just had a very huge drought and we also had floods and uh, we lost many lives. At the same time, the Italian government doesn't have a virtual water strategy. And we know that Italy is the eighth largest exporter of virtual water coming from vulnerable hydrological basins. So how would you relate and make um, not only policymakers, but also the general public understand that virtual water exports are as much as important as droughts and floods, like the invisible water is as important as visible water under climate change conditions. How can we communicate the importance of not exporting from vulnerable rivers and lakes and aquifers? Thank you. Well, I can start uh, with some of my thoughts and, and I am, um... I think Naho might be more uh, an expert than me on this area. When I was rereading Tony's papers about virtual water and policymakers, one of the um, aspects that he states is that policymakers don't love the idea of virtual water because, of course, they want the certainty and they do not want to, to say that the country has a water scarcity and needs to import its, its water for the food products or, or vice versa. So something that struck me is that it's actually a very hard message to give to a policymaker because it's not what the voters want to hear. It's, uh, it's something uh, that uh, it's uh, harder to, to explain. And um, it's something that they might be aware of, but um, decide not to use because it's not at their advantage. Um, that, that would be my, my only considerations and thought on what you, you mentioned, Francesca, about the situation in Italy. Hmm. Gosh, this is, this is a really, I think, important topic about sort of the visible water and the invisible water and how virtual water has become um, very much within the minds of policymakers in various countries around the world. And um, there are some countries that do to actually cite and mention virtual water, but not, not, not all, certainly. Um, ju just to touch up on Francesca's comments, I, I, I did a piece of commissioned work a couple of years ago for the European Parliament, and the way we sort of put the, the sort of consideration of virtual water in the debate was to link it through human rights to water. And that, that was, uh, an effective way, I think, to illustrate that um, it's not just about um, the water you drink here and now, it's also about the high reliance that you have on external territories outside of the EU, because this was for the European Parliament. Um, and 
I, I, I thought it was very interesting how this is tied to notions of the human right to water, that if you don't take into consideration what is happening in large scale plantations that export food to places like the EU, then the EU could be inadvertently be, um, be threatening the human right to water in these countries. Um, so I, I thought that was a, a, a very interesting debate to be had and perhaps one that might um, take a little bit more steam as we, you know, we talk more about the SDG 6 um, implementation goals and how that needs to be done, not just from a technical perspective, but also through these um, other notions of the human rights based approaches, etc. So, yeah, um, I, I also don't have a full answer for this, but I think um, there's there's certainly scope for including um, thinking about virtual water in different ways. And, and perhaps this kind of links back to what Lydia mentioned about silos in the sense that quite often, if you, if you think about water, it just gets um, sort of boxed into to debates of agricultural policy, when in fact it has a lot of implications to energy. How food is produced is also energy intensive. So there's energy policy implications. There's quite certainly um, implications on trade, on geopolitics, um, and issues of climate change as well. So perhaps it, um, there, there could be more discussions around how different sectors, um, policy sectors, could be a little bit more um, integrated on this point of virtual water. But yes, um, I, I think, again, there is much scope to unpack on this point. Are there any final comments, questions? Um, anybody who wants to just directly raise their hand and we can unmute you. No, I'm not seeing too much activity on the on the Q and A. Um, so in that case, perhaps um, we'll start bringing things to a close. Um, I I was really delighted when Lilia um, accepted to to deliver this lecture because we really wanted to get a broad range of um, people to contribute to this memorial lecture series. Not just people who are academics, but certainly people who are engaged in policy and people who are engaged in uh, advocacy. And um, it's also uh, you know, an, an extra bonus or an extra delight for, for us to welcome back um, a former student that Tony uh, supervised um, to give us some of their reflections over the years of what they've learned, what they've thought about. Um, so I, I'm very delighted that we can again come together as a, as a community in this way. Um, so Lydia, do you have any final thoughts or any last comments that you want to, to make to the group, to the audience? Well, I would like to thank you again for the invitation. It was very unexpected and a great pleasure. And um, the preparation for today took me on a very interesting train of thought uh, and also making the connections between the virtual water, food and agriculture, because looking back at, at the conversations we had with, uh, with Professor Tony Allen, also during the rare meetings we had, he always probed for like what I think about the food consumption, what I think about the consumers, what I think about the farmers. And uh, I always thought like, it's impossible that he wants my opinion because he's such a star. He like knows so much, um, but now I believe that he might be genuinely looking for, uh, might have been genuinely looking for for perspectives uh, and for, uh, you know, my my humble experience on the advocacy part that is very 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 different from from the science world. So, it was an, an incredible personal journey to go over uh, what. Um, I experienced as an advocate and to connect the dots with the uh, virtual water uh, area of work. So I want to thank you personally for that. And um, I am you know, open for, for any continuation of these conversations because I think it's only opening a box of hundreds of questions that do not have immediate answers, but that uh, as, um, as I mentioned, I believe that sooner or later they need to align, whether two, 20 or 30 years from now, it doesn't need to happen. Great, thanks for that. Um, I think that would also sort of give us a, a, a kick in moving forward this discussion further and to, and to also connecting um, with more people who are engaged in this topic of water, food, agriculture, um, and virtual water more broadly. 
So, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, t I'll share a final um, story about Tony Allen. When he came up with the notion of virtual water and realizing that there are different amounts of water required to make different types of food products, he realized that if you have a meat eating diet, roughly it's about a 5,000 liters a day per person. But then a vegetarian diet is 2,500 roughly speaking. And so um, he went from uh, being a meat eater to a vegetarian overnight. And I think that shows his dedication, that shows his pure engagement, his pure sort of enthusiasm in thinking more about how we manage water and how we manage it in, more su in a more sustainable manner. Um, he never used the word justice uh, to manage water in a just way, but I think a lot of the conversations that I certainly had with him and the, the work that he's done really does talk to the issues of, of these power asymmetries and power imbalances that are existing and manifesting through various stages of the food system and certainly at, at the scale of the farmers and at the scale of the consumers. So I hope that we can continue this conversation. Um, this is an annual lecture series. Um, and so we would always welcome any recommendations you have for a speaker next year. So please do continue um, engaging with us, being in touch with us. Um, we'll let you know when the recording is available. But um, my only final task is to once again, thank Lydia for this great talk and for bringing us together. Thank you so much and see you next time.